Streaming. Ready? Go. Okay, it is starting. Yep, it says it's streaming, so it should be hitting pretty quick. And I'll roll into OBS. There it is. Wet Fly Swing is now live. All right. I think we are good to go. How's it going, Darren? Good. How are you doing, Dave? Good, okay. good. It is starting. Yep. It says it's streaming, so it should be hitting okay, pretty I got so, uh, on here. And I uh, just wanted to check here, make sure all is good with you. Yeah, it looks like everything on this end is going well. Okay. All right. Yeah, we just wanted to, uh, for those that are on uh, a little early here, um, I'm Dave from uh, Wet Fly Swing, and I'm here with Darren from Piscator Flies. We're just going to chat here a little bit about fly tying. How's it going, Darren? Good, good. Uh, we're going to uh, have a, just a pretty casual uh, discussion about tying nymphs. Uh, I've, we've got a few questions that came up, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks, and I think we, you know, got the word out a little bit. So hopefully there'll be a few people on here that maybe have some questions for us. And yeah, we'll, we'll look at a few videos you have, but maybe you can chat just a little bit. We've got about, oh, five minutes or so before we jump on. Maybe you can do a little minute or so rundown about kind of what you have going and Piscator flies and all that. Yeah, sure. Well, I've uh, been running Piscator flies since about 2002 and basically it uh, just started out as a way to make a little bit of extra money and uh, started tying flies and uh, selling them on eBay and uh, just kind of continued from there so originally when I started I was doing videos on YouTube and uh, my equipment wasn't all that great so I kind of shelved it for uh, probably around 10 years. So just started actually posting videos again on YouTube in the last, uh, year, I guess, I guess last March is kind of when I started posting again. So it's been a, a nice process. Like I've been able to revisit some of the old patterns that I used to tie. Um, some of the ones that I created from a long time ago that, uh, maybe don't see, the light of day anymore but you know mm -hmm. dig them out of the fly box here and there kind of thing and and been able to uh take a couple of those and just you know with i might not have used them in five years or so but i have different thoughts on what makes a good fly so i've changed up that pattern a little bit as well you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah, that's good stuff. It's cool uh, chatting here because we actually on on the Wet Fly Swing uh, Fly Fishing podcast, my show I have on uh, on iTunes and elsewhere. We chatted. Oh, it's been a few months now. I guess uh, it, I think it was episode eight. So if anybody wanted to listen to that, they could go there and listen to us talk about. Really, it was pretty cool because you got into a bunch of history and some stuff I hadn't heard about with fly tying. So um, yeah, I wanted yeah. to put wanted to put that out there. And um, yeah, so it sounds like. Uh, everything is is coming together here for today i mean we're just gonna like i said jump in and have some a pretty casual conversation i think uh we might start off with uh the copper john and show some of the videos that you've done from the past and as we're going through the yeah. videos we'll, we'll chat about some of the flies and some of the tips and things that can help people get going yeah no, no that sounds great and i mean if anybody has questions while they're watching go ahead and use the live chat and type in your questions i'll keep an eye on that and if it see some questions I can answer. I'll answer them live on air here. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So we are getting closer. We've got a few minutes here. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I guess when we get on, we'll, we'll, we'll see who's on here. And, um, I've got a few other questions that, um, I can check in with you here, but, uh, yeah. Do you have anything before we get started, Darren, any other uh, things you want to throw out there to anybody? Uh, you're on uh, now. Where are you coming from? Um, I'm out of Ontario, just east of Toronto. Okay. On Lake Ontario, actually. And I fish a lot of the small tributaries that run into Lake Ontario. So a lot of these are just little creeks. You know, you can skip a stone across most of these. Okay. Um, and you've got a variety of different types of fish. You've got uh, steelhead that'll run up the rivers during most of the year. You got salmon, some of the Pacific mm -hmm. uh, species that were planted here. Yep. And then you've got a lot of coarse fish like uh, chubs and uh, um, buffalo head hmm. and or buffalo head or whatever oh, yeah. there. Yeah, totally. And uh, a, a lot of stuff you don't really see too often 
carp, that sort of thing, you uh-huh. know. Um, but there's also a lot of these rivers, they hold resident trout, so meaning they're not the trout that uh, are coming back in from the lake. So they're fairly small, you know, like yeah. typically what you would think of as a small creek trout kind of thing. Like and under 10 inches. Under 10 inches, and it's fun on a on a one weight. <laughs> yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, if we have time, we'll chat a little bit about maybe some of the techniques later um, as we get into it. But yeah, that's a cool thing. I'm over in uh, on the West Coast, the uh, this different side of the. Uh, I mean, the country. I guess different country, but different side of the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, nor- yeah. North America. But uh, no, it's cool, man. This is this has been fun. Uh, you know, connecting with you, and I think I'm going to continue doing these live events if I can every month on the fourth Wednesday. So hopefully you'll be able to come back on for another. You know, their episode, and I'm going to have other people that are going to come on too. And who knows? Maybe we'll, this will grow in. We'll have a bigger group, you know, kind of chat thing going here. And yeah, time. I think that would be pretty cool. You know, get a bit of a discussion <clears throat> going all around mm-hmm. fly fishing and fly tying. Nothing exactly. Wrong with that. Yeah, it's cool. I I was just chatting with uh, Tim Camisa here, and he was uh, had him on the show recently as well on the podcast. And I think uh, one of the flies that I tied is going to post on his YouTube channel this week as well. So. Okay. So that's kind of one of those cool things. That's, you know, this is like the fun part. We're just, you know, connecting. But, you know, ultimately we're just trying to, whoever is watching out there to maybe provide a few tips because I know there's a lot of stuff I'll learn here tonight probably from you as we get into this. So, Yeah, I did listen to that podcast actually last week, and mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that one. I didn't know uh, too much about Tim coming into it, but it, it's nice to kind of get that background information on some of the people that you – see on youtube or in the uh, different social media on fly fishing you know because everybody's got a story and until you hear it i mean it, they're just another face right exactly yeah that was the cool thing about tim i had no idea about the, his background and he has a, i mean a ton of great intro videos and stuff like that so so cool i think we are there it is 6 p.m on the west coast and 9 p.m on the east coast and uh, we're ready to get this going here so if uh we are just chit-chatting a little bit about, uh, you know, what we're doing here today, but I'll kind of run back through that really quick for those that are just coming on here. Uh, I wanted to welcome everybody to the event uh, tonight. This is just a quick little, uh, we're going to be here about an hour or so to talk fly tying. We have uh, Darren from Piscator Flies. Um, I'm Dave from uh, the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Podcast, and we're just going to chat a little bit about uh, tying flies. How's it going, Darren? Good, good. How's it going, Dave? Good, good. Does that sound good to you? Jump in and take a look at uh, um, some videos and, and just... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's do that. All right. So, um, yeah, I guess the first thing, one to check, we, we were talking a little bit about where um, where we're both coming from. So you're coming from the East Coast in Ontario? Yeah. And I am coming from uh, the West Coast um, outside in Oregon. So um, we're kind of opposite sides, but, uh, you know, we've got a common a common goal here is just really to hopefully teach people and maybe provide a few tips about uh, fly tying. Right, yeah. So, so yeah, I, we have a little bit of a um, keynote here. I was just going to zip through really quick just to kind of get us going, and, and um, we'll uh, take a quick peek here. So, so like I said, you can find Darren at piscatorflies.com, and you can find me at wetflyswing.com, uh, the podcast. Um, you can find that through this uh, as well, and it's on, on iTunes. So basically, we're just going to – this is pretty simple. I'm keeping this pretty uh, – you know, short and sweet here. We're going to uh, kind of, we got our intros out of the way here. We're going to just really get into some fly tying videos that we have uh, that some older videos that Darren's done some pre-recorded stuff. And as we're, as we're, the videos are going, we're just going to chat about what he's doing, some of the tips, some of the questions that come up from people um, that, you know, if anybody has any questions out in the audience, and then we'll have a little bit of a more formal Q and A at the end. Sounds good. All right. And I think, like I said, we're going to, this might take us, uh, you know, 45 minutes or so, give a little, uh, some questions and answers at the end. Plus, if there's other things that come up, questions as we get into this, we can kind of, kind of go from there. And uh, yeah, so let's, let's just jump into the first, uh, we're going to start here with this, uh, this little Copper John. There were a few questions. I put out a uh, message out on social just about, you know, folks that had questions with tying nymphs, you know, there's all sorts of problems with nymphs, but one of them was the um, the body, like getting a small body. So we're going to jump into this and just take a look at this video here in a second. And maybe you can talk a little bit about it. I'll, I'll just let it play. Um, and you can kind of talk about what we're seeing here. 
with this um, first fly sure. in and talk about why you queued this one up. Okay, yeah, this is probably one of my favorite patterns for fishing and uh, not so much for tying. Um, but, I mean, if one of the problems that I've found with this fly is uh, getting a nice separation when you're tying in the biots. And uh, what I've found um, is just if you tie them in both at the same time, and I what I do is I kind of, uh, when you look at the biots, when you cut them off, they've got a bit of a natural curve. So what you want to do is you just want to take one of those biots when you cut two off, flip them so that they're kind of splayed in opposite directions. And then when you tie them onto the hook, I like to try and be able to tie them like, more or less the entire hook shank length and put them along the sides and that kind of helps them separate out to the sides and you kind of get a bit more of that <clears throat> definition <clears throat> now the other way you can do that is if you put them on top of the hook shank and you kind of cross them um w which works as well and i i think uh my preference is to put them both together i think you get a little bit of a uh, motion when you go through the water rather than when they're crossed, oh, crossed on top. Okay. You get a bit of a different action, I guess. Gotcha. Uh, but really the main thing is just uh, making sure that you have a really smooth underbody, especially when you're uh, like wrapping wire like the Copper John or a Brassy or something like that. Mm -hmm. And part of it is just thinking, you know, like uh, when I first started tying flies, like I might – put the thread on and then I might tie the wire near the back because you only see it near the back. But, um, after tying coronamids for years, uh, one of the things that I found is if you tie the materials along the entire length of the hook shank, it's a lot easier to control how thick things get and how smooth things can get. And another aspect of that, I guess, is just the thread that you choose. So when you need something with a, a nice thin underbody, you're going to want to choose a thread that lays <clears throat> flat. So something like uh, UTC is really nice mm -hmm. rather than a uni. So I think oh, yeah. like the UTC 70, 70 yep. or the UTC 140 is really good. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of only started tying it and I've kind of been shifting from the UTC um from the uni like i used to tie almost exclusively with uni six aught thread but uh when you tie with the uni it's uh got a uh, got a bit of a spin on it so it's more corded mm -hmm. and uh when you're tying especially with smaller flies it's harder to get a nice smooth head or a nice smooth underbody and you get a little bit of uh ridge mm -hmm. build up on there so with the utc <coughs> makes it a little bit easier you can if you start getting a little bit of cording on there you can yeah just give it an unravel totally. and everything's that, nice and smooth there right that's what i found too i used to tie a lot more with the uni and that utc just it's pretty much my go-to the 70 denier is like the go-to stuff even when i'm tying yeah steelhead fly doesn't matter small or big it seems right. like i'm just always using that because it's just so much easier to tie with yeah i think when i first started tying flies the tendency was to go to heavier threads mm -hmm. and just because you, when you're first starting, you don't really have the same touch and uh, you tend to break a lot of ADOT thread, right? Yep. So, yep, and I was right. using the uni ADOT, which is a little more fragile than the UTC, I think. Um, and the other thread that I actually like recently is the Danville six aught, which mm. is actually 70 denier, which lies flat as well okay and you know it's uh the danville you've got a different range of colors than you have in the utc uh the danville you get a lot of um more like cat skills lighter trout shades whereas the utc oh. i find they're a little bit more what i would consider a little more west coast i guess if that makes any sense mm -hmm. just um in my mind it does but mm -hmm. saying it out loud it doesn't really make sense, <laughs> yeah <so. laughs> yeah no i'm just looking at you tied this this is uh this is the tricky part right here is like how do you i see yeah. you've got the really even underbody and now to keep those wraps um you know close together that's not always easy to do and you're doing a good job here and right 
so is there any, uh, the other way to do it is to tie it. I mean, if you didn't have to put material underneath it, then you could tie it on before you put all your wraps and then push it together. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah. this is a pretty clean, uh, pretty clean buy. So when you're doing this is how are you keeping them that tight? You just, so with the, uh, like the wire wraps, you yeah, mean? yeah. Just the way um, that's just, uh, so what I do is I'm not wrapping forward. I wrap just a little bit backwards and it kind of like pushes right against the wire oh, yeah. and it lays into it. So, and if you do have a little gap, like there's a little gap there, you can always just push take it. your thumbnail and yep. give it a push. Yep. And worst case scenario, it's, if it doesn't look good, those are the ones I keep and I'll, I'll fish those later. Yeah. But if I'm tying for a client, I got to yep. try and make sure it's more or less perfect, right? Yeah, totally. Okay. And now what's this you're tying on here? What's the, the flash? Or the, the t- uh, um, so that's actually, or I guess it's not flash. It's just a clear, it's, yeah, it's like a little mylar. Just, it's actually a, uh, flash from it, like the Easter basket grass. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So totally. it's, that's uh, awesome. I just saw it in the store and I'm like, perfect. Grabbed a couple colors. And like, it's like a buck or two bucks for a bag. It's probably a lifetime supply tying yep. copper john. So why not? Right. Nice. Um, nice. But it had a had a couple different thicknesses of uh, material, so I thought, you know, like for some of the thicker stuff, it's hard to find uh, thicker flash. So sometimes I'll just use uh, like a flashaboo, just a standard cut, and I'll take three or four pieces and lay it over mm-hmm. if I don't have a, a piece of magnum. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. No, this is this is a sweet looking pattern. So is this pattern? Uh... And where is this one coming from? Is, is this something, um, what was the name of it again? Uh, the Copper John. Yeah, or is this or is the, just, uh, just the style of Copper John? Is this a... Yeah, so it's it's just one of the variations, so... Yep. Uh, it's a John Bar pattern. But okay. when I was tying this, I was doing a collaboration with Mike from the Wooly Bug channel. And uh, so what we were doing is he was fishing these flies out in his fishing videos... And uh, I was tying the patterns, and then we'd just do a little bit of a cross uh, collaboration there just to tie it all in together. Mm -hmm. And so he was fishing at that time with some of these green colored uh, copper johns. So nice. Yeah. Nice. All right. Uh, So as you finish this thing up, is there any other um, tips you're going to, you might throw out there? Is it pretty straightforward on this one? Um, I think it's fairly straightforward. So there's another material on there, which is the uh, scud back or stretch flex. It goes by a few different names. Yeah. And uh, that's a, a really nice material to use. I think on the original they were used, uh, John Barr was using epoxy. So he was taking like a flash material and laying it over top of the uh, peacock hurl. Okay. And then putting a bit of epoxy on there. Gotcha. But I mean, yeah. for me nowadays, I don't think there's much of a place for epoxy yep. on my fly tying desk. And reason being, you can either substitute that with using like a synthetic, like this scud back, and then you don't have any hard shell on there, or you can use that and you can add a little bit of the UV resins mm-hmm. and just add a dab on there. And it, it's a nice touch. For the mm-hmm. patterns and um yeah. yes. i'll admit that i use quite a bit of resin <laughs> yeah and uh but i think you know if you if i'm gonna add it i'm gonna add it for durability or i'm gonna add it for to give a little bit of a, a gaseous glow around a fly like a chronomid i think those look really cool with a, a thick coat of uh solar res or mm-hmm. uv resin mm-hmm. around them mm-hmm. and it makes some of the materials, depending on where you're using it, kind of brings out the shine of them. So especially with the uh, holographics and uh, different things. Hmm. I've also used um, the solar res on like a wire body like this. Uh, but the only thing with that is it tends to get rid of the uh, segmentation that you have with the ribbit, with the uh, wire. And it kind of glosses over the body. So... And it doesn't really add any durability, but it's, I guess you could call it a variation of that pattern to some extent. Okay. But 
Okay, and yeah. what was the on the bead uh, when you're choosing beads on these guys? What what do you what do you use here, and, and how do you typically choose your beads? Um, I'm typically if I'm tying a nymph, I'll tie it either with a brass bead or a tungsten bead. And if I'm going to use a tungsten bead, these are the flies that I want to get down really fast. So I'm probably going to add a little bit of extra wire on there. So this one has a little bit of lead wire in behind the bead. And that also just kind of helps secure the bead in place so it's not going to be moving around too much. Mm -hmm. So uh, this one, I believe, is a tungsten bead. Yep. And typically, that's nowadays, that's what I'm using. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Ready to move on to the next one? Yeah, I think there's so. A nice, uh, there's a nice fish. Uh, nice fish there. Caught in, and, uh, okay, now th this one's definitely a little different style. The uh, Blushing uh, Onyx uh, Nymph, is it? Is that the name of this pattern here? Yeah, so that's uh, that's a really interesting one. So we had had a bit of conversation on the channel. There's another nymph. I'm not sure if you have this one queued up or not, but it's the uh, the mohawk no, nymph. No, no, we don't. Um, and basically, this was uh, another tires creation. And what they have with that is they have a strip of floss coming out from the eye of the hook over top of the bead. So you get like oh, this yeah. strip of like a mohawk sure, of gotcha. pink, uh, a hot spot. So, yep. you know, like there's a number of different ways you can add a hot spot to a fly. You can put it on the butt, you can put it in the collar, or you can use a hot bead. So this is just kind of another yep. uh, way to do it. <laughs> so we had talked about, you know, like when you're fishing these nymphs, if you've got this mohawk on the top of the bead like the idea on these jig hooks is that the hook's going to invert so yep. it's going to ride hook up and so you're not really seeing this hot spot of pink so we talked about well oh, right. what if we put it on the bottom and i think uh one of the gentlemen that uh frequents the channel uh joe duca and uh mm -hmm. sean mooney they were talking about well it's why don't we put it on the side maybe so i started experimenting with that and um this is the pattern that i oh, had cool. come up with so i was looking actually to create a dark nymph because i've got lots of olives and bright flashy things mm -hmm. and i don't have anything that's almost all black so this one was kind of perfect and it's got just a little bit of pink on the cheeks yep. and rather cool. than just going like with a full pink bead or something like that all right and this uh and the fire hole or this hook you're using this is pretty uh t a standard that you use quite a bit yeah i've uh just started using the fire hole hooks uh they're a company uh they're out of uh, bozeman montana i believe and uh i was just uh browsing their website i, I had seen their hooks come up on a couple uh different things and so i thought i'd give them a try and uh like i usually fish barbless hooks anyways but i'm more or less buying barbed hooks and just pinching down the barbs so i thought let's just cut the middleman on that mm -hmm. and uh we'll try some barbless hooks and the one nice thing about a barbless hook is depending on the hook style you're using like if you're doing a lot of beadhead flies having a uh, barbless hook makes it so much easier to put beads on hmm. some of these hooks like i don't know if you've ever had um <clears throat> like a, a mustad c49s and you yep. try and put like a, a a bigger bead if it's not drilled out quite correctly it can be a bit of a bear to get it on mm -hmm. you know and if you're using painted beads you can often chip the uh finish on those just by putting it onto the hook but with the barbless hooks it makes a a huge difference yeah. but just slides on there's no resistance whatsoever okay. cool and yeah. and putting the bead on here there's no secrets to putting this on on this type of hook you just slide on like normal down yeah yep. yeah it's uh i mean the only thing you might want to consider for a pattern like that is uh, upgrading to a slotted bead that's right and uh so i just use countersunk and partly because i'm a little bit cheap so I buy a lot of my stuff in bulk. So I'm buying mm -hmm. a thousand in one color and one size at a time. So for me to go out and buy a thousand of the slotted beads, it 
it adds quite a bit of an expense oh, gotcha. because the, the tungsten's fairly expensive. Yeah. So is this another tungsten bead here? Yeah, this is a tungsten. So. Okay. What yeah. percentage do you think of your beads are tungsten versus? Um, I'd say right now I'm probably running around 50% tungsten and 50% brass. And it depends on the size. Some of the smaller sized hooks will definitely lean towards tungsten just to get that little bit of extra weight. But in the bigger flies, it's if you're using brass, it's not as... Uh, is vital just okay. because you still have that weight, right? Yep, gotcha. And what now? What is this you're doing here? What What are you putting on? So for this one, um, I just put a little bit of floss, and part of the reason for that is just to kind of secure the bead. And so I've just put on a bit of floss and pulled it around the sides and secured it behind the bead, and then I add a little bit of solar res. Okay, solar res. And yeah. uh, cured it there, so then the bead's not going to roll, gotcha. and it's dry. Yeah. So I can go ahead tie the rest of the fly and then when i finish it i'm just going to accent it with a little bit of hot pink nail polish that i found at the dollar store yeah perfect yeah and where do you i know a common question is about getting materials i've had quite a few times yeah. do you have any any tips on that or is it pretty much just find whoever is uh you know locally or nearby or yeah it's one of those things you know you just have to kind of keep your eyes open i've got a few retailers that i trust online and you know, there's some brands that I prefer to use, and I've, I mean, I've bought a lot of materials over the years, and a lot of it's been not great, uh, but that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes you'll buy a material, and you bought it for a certain purpose, and it doesn't really work as work for what you bought it for, but you don't want to really throw it away, because it might come in handy somewhere mm -hmm. down the road, because, uh, but... For Marabou, the one that I like the best is the Superfly Marabou. Um, it's because it do a lot of polymering mm. type flies. And even when I'm tying uh, like Marabou wings or whatever, I like to strip the Marabou off the stem. And I like to have mm. that extra bit of length there. Okay. But it's really, really nice for polymering like Alaska boos and trailer mm. trash type flies, that sort of thing. Big stuff for steelhead and pike and trout. Okay. Yeah. Um, and for most other stuff, I don't know that it really matters, but uh, it, like if you're buying Hairline or if you're buying um, any of the name brand stuff, you know, any of the online fly shops that I've dealt with have been all really well, all really good, you know. And even shipping to Canada, I haven't had too many problems. The shipping's a little bit expensive, but that's uh, par for the course. Mm hmm. Cool. Yeah. And and now on the tail here, so typically is that a standard length? Uh, you're going to tie or is that a little bit longer um, than you might typically tie a nymph for this this type? Uh, well, this style, like the, uh, I think it's Pertagon. It's, uh, I think the Spanish translation means pellet. So these are like pellet flies. And I don't know the exact origin of them, but they tend to be tied with fairly long tails mm -hmm. and fairly sparse. So you're only using like, if you're using like a Coq de Lyon, it's only, you know, four, five, uh, hackle fibers on the tail and they just do get tied long. Okay. So this tail on this one might be a touch long, but, um, it, it'll still fish really well. Gotcha. No. And that, that was, I'm not quite sure on the nymphs, but I know I've, you know, for dry flies, that is one of those things where definitely having the right length, not too yeah. short is, is yeah. very important. For sure. Yeah. When you're doing the dry flies, it's more about like the proportions a little more important just to, for the fly to sit in the surface film, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you have a short tail, you're going to, the hook's going to just drop into the water and break the surface tension. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you've got a nice long tail, it just kind of sits just right. And totally. you kind of know when you got that proportion right, you can uh, sit your fly on your desk and the hook just doesn't touch the uh, the table. Yep. Kind of, exactly. You know? Cool. So yeah. is that, that wraps up this one pretty much? Yeah, this is a pretty simple fly. And this one has the wire body and uh, 
the only other thing on this one is just the polish. Um, so if you add, oh. and what I did add that polish, I don't know if I showed it on this huh. video or not, uh -huh. but when you do take the UV light, you can see a difference. So you can see like the floss fluoresces under the UV oh, light. I see, gotcha. Yeah. And the uh, polish, it's it kind of absorbs it. It doesn't reflect it the same way. That's so sweet. I don't know if that makes a difference, but yep. you know, like. Uh, <laughs> That's cool. Fish do have different eyesight than us, so yeah. if they are able to see those spectrums, you know, cover those two bases, who knows? That's cool. That's cool. Awesome. Well, it's all about uh, cool. It's all about uh, confidence. So we'll move on to the next one. That's awesome. Yeah. So you know, you get a fly that works and it's good to go, and just keep going with it. So here now we're, we are going to a different type of bead, right? On this on this brown line, uh, uh, this nymph here. Okay. Uh, it, it's got. Yeah. Um, basically uh, it's kind of i mean these are all three have been similar but um as yeah. far as yeah, this one's got a little bit different color uh, coloration and maybe as we get into this you could chat a little bit about um you know how this one's different it's similar body proportions right. though yeah so this i would say this is a, a similar style like sometimes you know you get on a bit of a kick so i'll be tying a lot of similar type flies so i might get on a marabou thing and i'll tie streamers with marabou or steelhead stuff with marabou um but i've been doing a lot of the creek fishing so a lot of the times when i'm fishing i'm fishing this type of fly so there's a a bit of a library being built up so this is another pattern that i came up with uh i think this is this year mm -hmm. and um so, and it's more or less inspired by the same style. So this one, I believe it has a tungsten bead on it as well, mm -hmm. uh, but just a gold. So you get the, yeah. the bright, this is a bit of a brighter fly and the name brown line. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, brown lining, but basically it's just fishing within <clears throat> urban areas. Oh, okay. So huh. if you can, if you can hear the traffic running, Beside oh, you, you go. And you're, if you're fishing for trout, you know, <clears throat> but it, it makes for some interesting fishing and you often get uh, a lot of non-fishing people coming by like it's highly populated areas. So curious people like I do a lot of that type of fishing. So you get people just out on a hike or whatever, mm -hmm. or, you know, sometimes people are. Uh, living out in the bush in some of the cities and they'll come up and chat with you sometimes and uh, you know I haven't had any negative experiences like that but it's uh, definitely different than going out in the wilderness where you don't see anybody around you know yeah yeah totally no, so, that's cool and look just looking at this pattern so it's going to be similar you're gonna have a similar size tail and yeah. body i mean how big is purport you know, proportions when you're tying these things, when you're getting it right. It seems like all these are very meticulous on making sure things are equal. Do you find yeah. that's, that's always, I mean, I guess you're tying a small, what size is this guy on anyways? So I'm typically tying on the videos. They're usually like a size 12, depending on the pattern. And so that's about as big as I'll fish them. And yeah. typically when I'm fishing them, I'm doing 14, 16s. Okay. Um, Even, but yeah. the bigger fly, it, it's just a little bit easier to see when I'm demonstrating it. So gotcha. No, and, and that was a tip I got. Uh, oh, I've got an entomologist coming on, Rick Hayfley, on the podcast. Oh, okay. um, he's going to be coming Very on cool. here in a couple of weeks, and that's one of the questions I know he's talked about. That he he's like, take a look at your nymph box, and if you see if you don't see half of the flies in size 16 or smaller for your nymphs, then you might want to recheck yourself. And, yeah. uh, you know, I don't think because, you know, it's a good, good point because they do take small flies. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, every time I'm out on the river, I'm turning over rocks and I don't often see nymphs this big, you know, yeah. like most of them are, you know, like size 16 down to 22s a lot of the times. I'm not going to be tying size 22s and fishing them, but I will go down to a 16 or an 18. Yep. Yep. You know, I think I think you need to offer a little bit of a morsel for them sometimes. So totally. And when you're tying for people, for your clients and things, I mean, are you see, are you getting a good range of big, big and large stuff all over the place? I mean, you tie mostly nymphs and streamers, right? Um, well, 
honestly, I, I tie a lot of flies for salmon and steelhead. Oh, right. So I get a big range, and and I don't really offer the nymphs too often, but I get I get requests for them, and if someone's going to request them, I'll tie them. But I don't have them listed or advertised on my sites or anything like that. Okay, okay, um, cool. But typically people are looking for the standard sizes that you'll find in the bins, so they'll be looking for size 10 down to like size 16. Okay, and you're tying, you wrap that um, <clears throat> that little rib uh, opposite, you counter wrap that. Was there a reason you did that? Yeah. Um, I typically counter rib most things, and mm-hmm. I don't know if it matters too much in this um, particular case, because we're going to cover that with a little bit of UV resin mm-hmm. uh, just to kind of protect that and give it a bit of extra durability. Um, but I typically, it, it's just sort of habit. So one of the things when I first started tying with woolly buggers, um, I was following along in a book somewhere and, you know, they tell you to do it a certain way. I'm like, okay. So I started tying them that way. I would go out and fish them and, a tooth would nick the hackle and the whole thing would just kind of fly apart. Um, and then I yeah. saw somebody show me just to uh, tie your hackle in at the front, wrap it back, reverse wrap it with a wire, mm-hmm. and you're good, right? And yeah. that wire adds a lot of durability. Yeah. So I started doing that, <clears throat> and it's just kind of carried on. So, mm. And a lot of it's just second nature. And it, you don't even think about it after a while, you know? Yeah. No, it's cool. I think it's some of the uh, different mentors. I may have asked this question on the podcast when you were on back at episode eight. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of great tires out there that are doing some good stuff on YouTube and all over the place with, you know, tips that you can get and, you know, just watching a few YouTube videos, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> so now for this step, you're going to add a little bit of uh, some dubbing here. And what do you use right. on this? So for the dubbing, I'm using a UV brown, and it's just kind of – the UV, it, it's kind of got a bit of a purpley tint to it. Okay. And the brown, it's just – it's not really bright. So I didn't want to go too bright with this. And I've fished this fly quite a bit this uh, spring and I've done quite well with it with uh, brown trout and uh, brookies and rainbows. I had a few chubs on there as oh, well. Cool. Cool. And you're doing, this is cool, splitting the thread here, doing your little dubbing loop. Yeah. So you can, rather than uh, taking the time to create a full dubbing loop, if you just need to add a little bit of dubbing, I I like this way better. It just doesn't add as much bulk. So you're using half the thread that you would with the standard dubbing loop, right? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's sweet. And then after this, you have, is there, are there a couple more steps or is this going to wrap this, this one up? Um, that's pretty much it. Just a whip finish and you can comb it out if you want. Mm-hmm. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Cool. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next one. I think we're going to move into some more of a, uh, like a soft hackle. And I was kind of thinking this gets me thinking, you know, as far as the legs, do you find, and this has a little hackle on the front, um, do you find you typically add legs to a lot of your nymphs, um, just a few or a lot, or do you find that, I mean, I've heard people say, hey, it doesn't matter, you know, they tie a lot of their nymphs without anything. Um, Yeah, I typically, I'll add some kind of leg, either I'll put some hackles out to the side or like a soft collar, uh, like a soft hackle or... Even like on the last one on a brown liner, we've the ice dubbing collar is sort of what I would consider the legs and the fly. Yeah. All oh, right. So I like to have a little bit something. Um, just to me, again, getting back to the confidence fly thing, this is kind of what I'm most comfortable fishing with. And if it doesn't matter, it, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day, right? If yep. I've got legs on there or not, totally. but. I think it does make a little bit of a difference, you know. If you if you're trying to create something that's somewhat impressionistic, it just, I mean, adding that one extra detail is not going to hurt. Yeah. And now, what is the name of this one again? Is this a- so? This is a soft hackle pheasant tail. Just so, so yeah, okay. It's it's basically a standard American pheasant tail, mm-hmm. and rather than just putting the um, 
putting like uh, a wing case and legs out to the side, just put on a soft hackle on here. Okay. And you're using uh six aught thread here? Yeah. So this is one of my earlier videos. Oh, okay. You can, you can kind of tell by the color of the video. It's got a, a bit of a yellow tinge okay. to it. So <laughs> cool. I've upgraded some of my lights. Yeah. And, uh, so it, it it's, it's a process, right? Yep. So I don't know if you can tell, but if you look at the head <clears throat> on that top pheasant tail, you can kind of see the cording that I was talking about uh -huh. yeah. with the uni thread. Yep. So if I was using a UTC, it, the head would be That's a right. lot smoother on there. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and again, I don't know that it really is going to make any difference no. to the fish. But again, it's uh, what you feel comfortable with and yeah, what kind you of get, what helps you out, right? What you get used to and, and when and the type and the thread you use that you don't break all the time. That's one another big yeah. thing for sure. Okay, so and it looks like I can't I can remember what hook this was, but it looks like a standard uh, nymph hook. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, Mustad Signature. Yep. Um, Thirty nine oh oh six B. Yep, perfect. Yeah, that's cool. Right. Some good old hooks. So okay, so you're gonna get your tail, and you're measuring it off by basically the length of the the hook hook shank length. Yeah, and that's I find if you've got if you can uh, measure on the hook, this kind of helps when you're tying into smaller hooks. So this one again, it's probably. Uh, size 12 or 10 maybe even mm -hmm. uh, but as you go down you know like the proportions of the hook stay the same so if you're measuring on the hook shank or the or on the gap kind of thing or half the gap or half the hook shank yep. you can kind of maintain that consistency as you get smaller and smaller okay um, and again just practicing this is the main thing so yeah how many what I like how uh, how many flies do you think you have to tie before you're feeling confident in a new fly? Um, maybe half a dozen before mm -hmm. I kind of figure out a few of the little tricks. And even if you watch a video, you know, you still have to tie that fly a couple times before uh, you get comfortable with it. And there's even if I'm giving you a tutorial, there's things that I'm not really thinking about that you might need to think about and it's um it just comes with experience i guess mm -hmm. yeah nice, so nice. and the pheasant tail uh like a beadhead pheasant tail is one of the first flies i ever tied and so this mm -hmm. is this is one that i really like the pheasant tails and yep. I, li I like fishing them i like tying them uh, i just think it's nice to be able to work with the natural materials mm -hmm. and you can use the pheasant tail you can use it for the tail you can use it for the body you can use it for the wing case you can use it for the legs and the only other thing you need in there is a little bit of wire to help with the durability yeah and some peacock hurl just for the totally. uh, thorax right no, it's, I was, it's, uh, whatever I see the pheasant tail, I think of, uh, Jim Teeny, maybe some people know him out there. He's an old steel yeah. header. And I mean, he created basically the entire company, not only on the lines he, he did, but, uh, you know, the teeny nymph, which is just, just a pheasant tail, yeah. different dye, different colors and very super simple. And, yeah. and he's caught, I had him on, on episode five of the podcast and it's just amazing. You know, he's caught, I don't know how many different species on that little, on that little, uh, with pheasant tail. Oh yeah, it's pretty incredible, and you're right. It's probably one of the most simple patterns out there, and it's one material, right? Just yep. pheasant tail. And I remember tying those again when I was first getting into it. Um, somebody had sent me a tail clump, and uh, all they wanted for it is a couple of flies. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I went up and searched pheasant tail patterns and found, you know maybe a dozen different patterns so i tied him a couple dozen flies and sent it to him and i remember him commenting like i didn't know you could tie so many different things with just pheasant tail <laughs> and it's it is it is really incredible it's yeah. one of those staples right totally and uh totally. i mean i i like the new synthetic products that come out and there's something to be said about the innovation that all that involves but i mm -hmm. still really have a soft spot for the natural materials. Mm -hmm. And what are you using here for the uh, um, you got that here? So that's just a uh, jungle cock feather. So on the bodies, okay. they have uh, 
Just let me grab one here. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so I tie quite a few things with uh, jungle cock. Mm -hmm. So when you buy the cape, you get all the eyes up here. Yep. But you also, a lot of times, you'll get these feathers here. And there's a few different good feathers in here. So I probably got buckets full of these mm -hmm. which are just the uh yeah uh saddle hackles but they make a, ni a nice uh feather you can strip them down you can use them as legs on nymphs or you uh -huh. can use them as a soft tackle and they're great for that nice. but i think they're kind of an overlooked thing mm -hmm. if you don't like a lot of people don't have access to jungle cock which is is fine and uh i would say it's not quite as nice as using like the proper partridge partridge has a nicer yeah uh speckling on it i guess right and this is nice it's got a bit of it's more of a, a furnace or a badger type look mm -hmm. to it so you got mm -hmm. like the white tips in the dark center so yeah, yeah it's cool um, yeah but oh. it it wraps nicely like it it wraps uh similar to like a pheasant feather so mm -hmm. or not a pheasant uh partridge partridge yeah which is great yeah. stuff too yeah. yeah cool all right so that is going to pretty much wrap this one up right yeah cool and again if you wanted to modify that you can always add a bead head or something to that or you can add a little bit of yep. weight underneath that if you need it exactly okay cool let's move on to the next one here and we got a another little uh pattern that has some pheasant tail in it and uh this one has a little bit different it looks like you got some um in the thorax a little bit of flash and um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the name of this one and what this one's all about. All right. Looks like it's. Um, I'm trying to. I'm trying to see. Well, you have goose bite. You're back to okay. the bites, right? Yeah. So that's the uh, evil weevil. Oh yeah. So that's uh, Jeremy Davies. Okay. He's out of uh, Calgary, Alberta, and um, he's a fairly young guy. He started tying flies when he was quite young, and one of the guys that he mentored with, uh, he taught me to, I think he was the first person to teach me to tie flies as well. And he's passed on a few years mm. back, but um, Evil Weevil has been a really good pattern. And I would mm. kind of put it, you know, like Copper John, mm -hmm. Pheasant Tail, Evil Weevil. If you've got those three patterns, you know, you're, you're pretty set. So this one has Pheasant Tail, um, and then the biots is for legs, basically. Yep. And again, there's a bunch of different variations of the evil weevil, and uh, mm -hmm. this is this is one that it's uh, I've done really well on this in the creeks as well. Hmm. Yeah, it's cool. So I think you... this one I'm just using a brass bead on yep. here. Yep. Brass bead and just uh, looks like just that curved caddis hook. Yeah, so typically uh, the hook I was using is the Mustad C49S, and mm -hmm. I really like that hook. It's got mm -hmm. a, a nice backbone to it. And more recently, I've gone to the Firehole 315 in the Barbless model. Mm -hmm. And they've got a fairly similar curve. They've got a straight eye coming out. Mm-hmm which I find really nice for nymphs and chronomids. Nice. Yeah, this is a yeah. sweet, sweet looking pattern here. And uh, so as you get into this one, are there any tips that you think about that, um, I mean, I, you're using beads quite on some of these flies, and that's one thing. How do you, you know, I getting that pile up towards the bead, is there a way you keep from making a big, uh, building that big mound up front? Or a lot of the times maybe you're trying, you're, you're not mining that so much? Um, no, I think you do have to keep it in mind. And again, it's just somewhat with repetition and you kind of get a feel for how much room you need to leave for your thorax. Mm -hmm. And really it's when you're tying that it's, it's mostly about the thorax is how big you want that. So I think typically I try to match the size of the thorax to the size of the bead. Um, in terms of how much of the hook it takes up like it might be a little bit bulkier but in like it but it might only be like four millimeters 
and the bead might be a four millimeter bead. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I was just kind of looking at some questions um, sure. that we had from um, some people like I mentioned here. And uh, one of them was on UV, like when to use it. Is there a standard, you know, like how do you know when to use UV, when not to? Are you just trying to give it a little, a little flash, something different? Yeah. So in terms of uh, like using like a UV ice dub, versus just a standard ice dub you mean yeah that, that would be yeah, yeah like i mean that's the kind of that, one of those things i guess like people are thinking like well we're, why not just use it on everything you know why not always yeah. use it and i think that's totally fine if you wanted to use it on pretty much everything but yeah. um and i usually i do use it quite a bit like I'm, when i'm mixing my dubbings i'll often just take a little bit of pearl uv and i'll just add a little bit in just for accent um, I think part of that is just, again, getting back to what the fish see versus what we see. They see uh, different wavelengths. So if they could see that UV um, where we can't see it or they pick up mm. a little glint of something, you know, mm-hmm. it's uh, going to help them key in on your on your lure, on your fly. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Okay. And, um, and we've been – and we're looking at some more beads here, but – Crowding the eye is another question that kind of, cha- you know, a lot of challenge for especially new tires. I think right. one thing that's helpful there is starting just, you know, not leaving yourself room up front, right? Just making a point where you're not going to yeah. tie. Is that kind of, you know. Yeah, any- especially if you're tying um, flies without beads, I, th- I think it's a little bit harder to kind of leave enough room. Um, so typically – if you if you find yourself having problems with that, uh, start your thread back a few wraps behind the eye. So rather than right behind the eye, give yourself a little bit of space, like two millimeters maybe, mm-hmm. and just start there. And then tie your fly as normal, and you should be able to kind of keep that as a gauge to leave enough room for your head. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. And I was just thinking as I was talking, I, I, Kelly Gallup, probably some people know out there, he's going to be uh, coming on the show. I just talked to him. So oh, hopefully down the line, maybe we'll okay. get him here to, to do some fly, tying flies. But, yeah, he's got a bunch of tips like that. And that's one, the same thing he said was basically take the pattern you're trying to copy, put it right there. That's always a good thing to always have a pattern right. you're trying to copy. Yeah. Yeah. And then find out where the back of that head, th- the head is on that that looks good. You yeah. just wrap your thread to the back of that head and don't wrap anything forward of that. Exactly. Of that wrap. Yeah. And then, and then yeah. you, you might have a lot of room, but that's better than being piling too much. Yeah, I think if you have a little bit of space in front, it might look a touch funny, but your, uh, your fly won't be crowded. The main thing about having your eye crowded is you can kind of cover up that eye sometimes. Mm-hmm. And if you're doing that, it might make it hard just to even – tie on your fly or you might be putting uh head cement on there and it's gonna yep. uh, spill into the eye and then cause a bunch of different <coughs> problems with that as well right yeah exactly no this depending is, on yeah you know. this is a cool uh i love this pattern this is uh it's looking good and when you tie in these the the biots are you so you can tie them in and then you tie on them and then wrap in front of them is that kind of the trick to getting these tight or any other yeah so basically, I just want to kind of hide the uh, thread wraps as, as much as possible. Yeah. And that's a little bit tying with beads. It makes it a little bit easier to do that sometimes um, just because mm-hmm. you've got a that cavity behind the beads. So you can kind of pull a little bit of material into there and you oh, can kind you of pull your thread in there. So if you uh, want to finish a fly off with a little bit of dubbing, it uh, makes it fairly easy just mm-hmm. to conceal all those thread wraps, especially on something like the Evil Weevil where you've got uh, – where you're tying in those biots, you can leave a bit of a tag there. So mm-hmm. it's nice to be able to kind of tuck those away. Oh, yeah. No, this is cool. Yeah, and then you put a little bit more on top of there to cover that. And yeah. you are getting some, some bulk there, but it's not going to affect the fly because you're going to just cinch it right down and – Right. Yeah. So it's just a big thorax. And do you ever tie that over the top of the, like use that mylar or whatever you're using uh, and go all the way over the bead as well? Or is that something? No. Yeah. No. Just keep it always back. Yeah. So, 
And uh, actually, that's a good point. When you're pulling mm. this in, it kind of helps separate those legs a little bit, which is a nice feature. And then after I wrap it in, uh, you don't want to cut it flush against that thread because it's a stretchy material. If you uh, cut it too f uh, flush, it can wiggle back through those thread wraps. Oh, right. And uh, it'll yep. just pull out. So exactly. Okay. Another thing I should mention is when I do <clears throat> tie that down, you probably notice that I'll go on both sides when I'm wrapping. I'll wrap on the inside, outside, inside, mm -hmm. outside. You're kind of just like overlapping those thread wraps, so it really locks stuff in place. It's just nice. uh, another way to add a little bit more cool. durability to the fly. Totally. So yeah, no, it is. Those yeah. are those are good tips. Okay, well, let's move on. I think this is the last video here, and okay. we're getting close. I guess we're coming up to uh, about ten minutes away from the uh, end of the hour here. So this golden olive nymph is another cool. A uh, little dark beauty here. It's got, yeah. uh, you know, so maybe, yeah, you can talk a little bit about this one and any, any tips okay. that come of, of this here. Yeah, so the golden olive, <clears throat> it's actually the fly that I caught my first fish on this cool. year. So actually the first time out this year I got skunked. And uh, so this was nice to have in my box. I actually only had one in my box and ended up hanging it up in a few trees and – it still came home with me, which is hmm. great. So, yeah. So this one here in the vice, the tail's a little bit heavy on it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think this might actually be the one I took out on the water with me. Um, not 100% sure on that. But basically the idea behind this is just <clears> something <throat> with a bright bead. And, again, I'm just looking for a bit of a darker olive body. Mm -hmm. and so just kind of a generic type fly mm -hmm. but uh yeah. and again the rib with the gold just kind of a contrasting color against the body where you can kind of see those segments pop out right yeah it's and just, it's really yeah that's rib but you're using yeah. what are you using here for the rib it's just a ultra wire it's fairly thick yeah i think that's probably a brassy size oh brassy oh so this is a small that. what size was this i guess i missed that uh i think it's probably a size 12 size 12 yeah. okay okay yeah. so i don't think i I don't think I ever really tie smaller than size 12 for the videos. Okay. Um, there, there might be one or two where I'll tie a size 14, but oh, gotcha. okay. start, you start to lose a little bit of the uh, detail when you get oh, into the smaller sizes, that's right? That's a good point. Yeah, that is a really good point. So. Okay. If I could tie them in size sixes and they would still look okay, I probably That's would. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I've tied a few on videos with like size 18s and 20s. Yeah. And yeah, you yeah. do lose a little. And then, yeah, the sixes are a little bit too big. So you're right. That is a good YouTube style size. Yeah. Well, what do you – now, deciding what to tie, is this – how do you how do you decide? I mean, that's a common question um, to get to. Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> for me, I'm just basically – every time I'm out, like I said – I'm looking under rocks, so I'm uh, in different rivers, and I carry a notebook with me, so I'll write down what I'm seeing, what I'm catching. Um, if I'm seeing any insects out in the air, I'll try and have a look, you know. So, And I'm always surprised when I see insects I don't really recognize. So I'll see um, fish flies or something like that, something that is not – normally part of the uh fly fishing vernacular it's just i mean they're present and i'm not sure if the fish are actively feeding on them so i'll just sit and watch mm -hmm. see what they're taking off the surface if they are or if they're not then i'll just start turning rocks over and seeing what's crawling around underneath and so based on that is uh, i'll usually go back home with a few ideas and I'll uh, search for patterns, and if I don't find a pattern that kind of matches that, I'll just whip something up, mm -hmm. which is the nice thing about fly tying. You know, you've got – if you've got the materials and you've got uh, a little bit of time to do some research, you can pretty much do whatever you want, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and so now you're building up another nice uniform body, and as far as your bobbin here, is, do you do – you, does you think it matters at all, or you think all bobbins are, are kind of the same, or do you have any any uh, tips there on what to use? Um, 
I think whatever feels comfortable. Um, for me, one of the ones that I like to use the most are kind of these shorter style metal bobbins. Oh, okay. And they're not they're not the prettiest thing, but mm-hmm. when I'm tying, I like to keep things tight in my hand. So the same with my scissors. Yep. Um, like I always tie with scissors in my hand if I can find them. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I tie, yep. I have my scissors on my ring finger. And so I'm using arrow point scissors, and okay. it's a three and a half inch. And I've probably got about 30 pairs on my desk somewhere of these, and I go through probably a pair a month. Hmm. And after that, they're just, well, they're still good for cutting wire or for giving to the kids to play with kind of thing, but they're not uh, good for cutting materials anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but it just kind of tucks in your hand really nicely. Okay. And Perfect. you can hold your scissors and your thread at the same time, and they don't really interfere with each other. Yep. And so it, just, it, and it saves you a lot of, in the long run, tying a lot of flies, it saves you a considerable amount of time. Yeah, um, like even watching some of the uh, professional tires, like I still see a lot of them. They'll set their scissors down in between um, steps, so they just pick them up when they need them. But mm-hmm. um, and that's one of the things I kind of uh, took on early on is somebody gave me the tip, you know, like if you want to tie a little bit faster, you know, keep your scissors in your hand. So it practiced that for a little bit and found something that worked something that was comfortable and now if my scissors aren't in my hand it just doesn't feel right so Mm -hmm. it's something's out of place right yep yeah exactly nice so So you want to talk a little bit as we uh get close to wrapping this up about spring uh cricks is there any tips or i mean are these the flies you're tying here tonight is this are these some patterns you'd be using on some for the spring cricks Oh, yeah. Pretty much everything here is something I would be using on uh, the creeks or call them tributaries up here mm. and uh, anything that runs into Lake Ontario. Oh, okay. So, um, the th- like, uh, most of these are fairly shallow. Like, uh, and when we get the runs of salmon and steelhead, you know, like, a lot of the water is just thin enough for these fish to pass through. And a lot of times they're breaching the water to get up to the next pool. Uh-huh. So basically you're fishing pocket water. So you're just finding a, uh, a little pool, fishing that for a couple minutes and then walking up to the next one. And uh, so the bead head flies work really well for this type of thing. And I also do fish a few different dry patterns uh, when the fish start taking flies off the surface. so mm-hmm. And typically I'll do some form of uh, tight line nymphing, like uh, Euro nymphing or check nymphing, oh, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Yep. Without, and, without uh, an indicator. Yeah. <clears throat> so a lot of these waters, they're not, I don't find that they're deep enough to uh, really need an indicator. So, like, most of the water that I'm fishing, like, if it's three feet, it's it's a deep pool kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it's, you know, like, two feet deep for the most part, just uh, under cut banks and that sort of thing. So, if you've got, uh, like, a lot of times I'm only using a six-foot rod um, or maybe a nine-foot rod if I've got a little bit more space to reach out. And we're just kind of drifting around and... Uh, you've got enough contact with the bottom right? Uh, that you're not going to hang up too often. Mm-hmm. But I guess that comes back to brown lining. One of the things that I found, uh, certain pools on a lot of these rivers, you have to be careful because they do end up um, accumulating things like shopping carts huh. and uh, yeah. bicycles and yeah. <laughs> that sort nice. of thing. So you just That's have to cool. be careful. You don't catch up on one of those. But yeah. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think we're we're getting ready to wrap this one up, and I think this is our sixth video. We've zipped right through these, and we are coming yeah. close to uh, our hour-long uh, time here. So I don't know if you had, um, maybe before we get off here, uh, let people know where to find you, or if you had any other anything else you want to throw out there before we, uh, we move on here. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, 
Well, thanks for having me on, Dave. I think yeah. it's been pretty cool. We uh, actually had to work a little bit to make sure that we could get both of us on the screen at the same time yeah, with our yeah. voices working and yeah. everything. But I think it worked out fairly well. And I'm, yeah. I'm glad you uh, asked me to do this. It's been a nice time. Yeah. If you want to check out some more of my videos, uh, hopefully Dave will leave a link in the description here. Mm -hmm. uh, you can check out my channel, Piscator Flies. And if you're interested in purchasing some of the flies, you can get in contact through me with me through there. Uh, I don't list most of the stuff that I tie on the channel, but uh, if people are looking for them, I'm always available for that as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, and I just threw up some, uh, oh, just some a uh, few of the questions. I think we answered uh, a number of the questions I was kind of looking at today in the, um, you know, that we had there. And if folks want to find the next webinar, I, I, I'm going to be doing this, like I mentioned at the start, every kind of the fourth Wednesday as it works out. So you can go to, to that URL, that, uh, URL or uh, let's see, wetflyswing.com slash webinar. And you can sign up there for the next one, and I'll get, give you an update if you want to catch the next one. I'm not even sure who will be on. Maybe it'll be uh, maybe it'll be Tim. Maybe it'll be, um, I don't know, maybe you'll be back on. But, uh, yeah, it's been fun. It's kind of the, the podcast that I do is all audio. So it's actually kind of cool to take it a step further and see the tying and actually kind of talk face to face here. So, and I'm yeah. actually, and I'm actually going to do some local local meetup stuff here too, where I'm at. So I think eventually we might evolve this into where there's some local tires at the same time as we're doing this online thing. So, sounds great. Yeah. All right. Well, we I think we're hitting this timer uh, right on perfectly. This uh, we got our we got our hour solid hour in. So. Yeah, I just want to thank you again, Darren, for coming on, and it's been fun. I know we'll probably stay in touch, and I'll, like you said, I'll make sure to get links to your to your stuff if people want to get in touch with you. And uh, yeah, until the next one, we'll, we'll see you. All right, thanks, Dave. It's All been right. a pleasure. Cool. Thanks everybody for checking it out. All right.